Back in the day when chatting online, you could say, be right back, meaning you had to go and do things in the real world, and then maybe you would connect again. Nowadays, no one really says that because we're always online. Despite digital detox cabins becoming the ultimate luxury holidays, and despite countless videos telling you to ditch your smartphone, get a dumb phone, and delete social media, very few of us can actually do it. Your relationships depend on it, your work depends on it, and your existence in modern society depends on it. Let's face it, digital minimalism is a privilege very few can afford. So today I'm going to try and figure out what to do if you can't ditch your smartphone or social media, but you're still want to stay sane and live in real life. Don't get me wrong, I love the idea of downgrading your phone and limiting your presence on social media or even cancelling it altogether. But some of us just can't. Our jobs require us to be available even on evenings on certain days and we need to have slack on our personal phones for work. And since I double in content creation and digital marketing, I need to be present on all social media platforms, even if only in ghost mode. So what now? For the purpose of this video, I'm differentiating between hardcore and adaptable digital minimalism. Hardcore digital minimalism will involve deleting all social media, downgrading your phone to a damp phone, and deleting all unnecessary apps, leaving the most essential ones such as messaging and calendar. Adaptable digital minimalism will rely on intentional design, flexibility, meaning that you can scale it up or down, and awareness. But by principle, you don't need to delete anything off your phone and you don't need to spend hours going through every single piece of digital trash that you created over the years. I'm trying to create an adaptable digital minimalism framework for myself and people like me who, either because of their work pressures, family dynamics or financial resources, cannot commit to the hardcore version. And also for people who do want all the apps on their phones and they want to have social media presence or need one, people in long distance relationships, people who may have family abroad and therefore a part of their lives will always be online. People who are either depressed or have social anxiety and social media provides them with meaningful social interaction. People who want all of this but who also want to be happy and not let it negatively affect their mental health. Focus when they need to focus and don't get overwhelmed. I will share everything that has worked for me but the whole idea is for this video to be a playbook not a rule book so you can pick and choose whatever fits your needs and your lifestyle. Since today's app developers are working extremely hard to make apps as addictive as possible, our lives are a bit like you want to give up eating sweets, but you live in a candy store where everything is for free every day. That's literally how it feels. An average person reaches for the phone 200 to 300 times per day. That's like once every four minutes. Oftentimes it happens when there's an awkward pause at dinner or you're waiting for the bus. Has it ever happened to you that you reach for your phone to check Google's Maps location and then 30 minutes later you're watching what your cousin's wife had for breakfast yesterday. One way to reclaim your time and focus would be to put your phone on flight mode whenever you really need to focus and you know you don't need to be online. For people who absolutely cannot trust themselves, there are those boxes where you lock your phone and it won't open until certain time lapses. I quite like productivity session apps, for example Forest, which allows you to open a focus time session and at the same time it plants a very virtual seed that grows into a tree. But each time you switch to a different app, the tree dies. They offer a free version with basic functionalities for Android, but for iPhone you would need to make a one-off purchase. And currently my favorite screen zen, which allows you to block or limit selected apps. So you could for instance choose that you want to open TikTok only three times per day for five minutes, and after that time it will lock you out. Or you could pick to have a pop-out screen every time you open these apps asking you, are you sure you want to open this? So this creates friction with using these selected apps and minimizes the time you can spend in them. I'm not going to do this detailed cleanup where I would have to go through every file, every app, every photo of food that I took back in 2018. But I will have a moment of reflection here. The principle of intentional design, as laid out by Carl Newport, dictates that we proactively and regularly look at our digital tools and deliberately choose which ones we want to use and how we use them. Who's this Carl Newport guy? 
He's a professor of computer science and the author of Digital Minimalism and Deep Work, so he knows his thing. And have you read any of those? No, but I read Great Summaries on Shortform, which is a platform that offers detailed summaries of non-fiction books. Can't you get summaries online or something? Well, this is different. The summaries are prepared by professionals, very detailed, chapter by chapter. It's like the book, but condensed. And you also get access to audio, articles, and curated reading lists for different aspects of personal development. All that for the price of one book per month. Okay. By joining through the link in the description box, shortform.com, Daria, you will get a free trial of unlimited access and an additional 20% of your annual subscription. With intentional design, you identify your values and priorities and assess whether how you use digital tools supports and reflects that. And the key to it all is realizing one important thing. Our focus, our energy, our attention, are our most precious unrenewable resources. We are all mortal beings and time is the most precious thing that we have. So think about the number of weekends that you get with the person you love or the number of holidays that you will get to spend with your family. It's all limited and you don't want to decrease the quality of that by looking at your phone. The time you spend scrolling, you could invest in relationships with people you care about or working on your dreams or building a better future. Yet here you are watching cat videos again. <laughs> I don't really see any shortcut here but to sit and let it sink in. Act like you're mortal because you are and act like you value your time because if you don't there's a chance you won't do much with it. I would start by looking at my screen time and the main apps that I use. So obviously there's a lot of social media here. And another thing that really opened my eyes was mood tracking. So every time that I would use either of these social media apps, I would track either in my own Notion template or on paper how I feel after using them. And YouTube was fine, unless I watched too much and I felt overwhelmed. TikTok made me very anxious because I'm in this conspiracy theory algorithm, which is probably my fault. And Instagram just made me feel shit time and time again. And that's quite alarming that I'm willingly making myself sad and anxious quite often. Which brings me to my second point. So despite all the ad blocking in the world, every now and then you will still pick your poison. So here's my take on this. We already know which apps make us feel bad. Let's make them less toxic. I want to start with Instagram because that's what impacted me the most. And obviously I would want to blame everything on Mark Zuckerberg. But the important question is, am I part of the problem? And I realized that I was. I noticed this strange thing. There are definitely people who do not like me, who still follow me on Instagram. They never like or comment on anything, but they're there, watching, probably hoping that I fall on my face in the mud or something. But I think of them when I post. I think about the people who were mean to me in high school, or the ex who thought I wasn't pretty enough. And that influences how I post. So there could be a day that I would be gloomy, or maybe sad, or disappointed in myself. But instead of posting authentically, I'm thinking, would I want those people to see that? No, let's post a summer throwback photo. And that is bad. Posting for your haters is bad. I try to no longer do that. I try to post for my friends, for my family, for anyone who can benefit from it. I post memes I found online and memes from my own life. I post for anyone who can laugh with me at how absurd and silly life can be sometimes. And then when I post, I also think back to the younger Daria, insecure, probably in high school. And I think, how would she feel seeing this content? Would she feel empowered or would she feel bad about herself? Second thing, just unfollow people who are not nice or don't make you feel good. But what if you can't? There's probably this co-worker who insisted that you follow each other on Instagram. Well, what do you do? You can mute them, which means you will not unfollow them, but you will never see their content. You would probably not call up on your toxic friend to go grab coffee together. So why do that in the online world? Jealousy? Curiosity? Sense of control? just let it go. With TikTok, I quickly realized that it keeps showing me conspiracy theories, probably because I'm interested in them, but also I realized that they make me very anxious. So I decided to press on every piece of content that triggered me in some way and chose not to see anything like this in the future. With YouTube, I noticed a different pattern. Watching one self-help video really boosts my motivation, sometimes two are also helpful, but it happened to me that I would watch five or six, and then at the end of it, I wouldn't even remember any of it. So I decided to set myself a limit. I only watch up to two videos after which I take a mindful break. 
and it works pretty well. But if you have other apps that you feel are not aligned with how you would want to use them, try to think of ways in which you could make them less invasive and less detrimental to your mental health. Because I cannot influence how much I have to be online for work, I try to maximize my free time to make sure that the way in which I interact with the online world is never at the expense of the real world. And to do that, I made a few rules for myself. For example, I never work or sleep with phone in the same room. That was particularly useful to escape the mindless scrolling before bedtime or after waking up, which was really not helpful. And at first, I felt really restless, and what helped was having crossword puzzles or books to read so that I could just keep myself busy with my thoughts spiraling in my head. I do dinners and walks without my phone or with phone in flight mode and I try to incorporate a lot of mindful activities where I do things with my hands so drawing, coloring, cooking, even cleaning. In periods of my life where I struggle with anxiety or feelings of loneliness, I try to make sure that I use social media to add to my social interactions and not replace them. So for example, going to yoga classes where I don't know anybody makes me feel more connected than being online, even though there were times in my life where online support groups were a real lifesaver. Overall, do more things that make you forget your phone. Technology and social media can be both massive forces for good. So as Carl Newport said, determine how you use technology, not whether you use it. One of my very strong conclusions is that social connection is precious and no amount of online time can replace it. So I will do my best to make sure that the way I use technology fosters true and genuine connection. Don't forget the person standing right next to you while being focused on the person you want to be online. When online, I also want to be mindful of the fact that we never know who's on the other side and it could be somebody who's going through something difficult in their life so I want to make sure that the trace that I leave online is always a positive one. And finally, we are all mere mortals with limited time on this beautiful planet so I'm not sure funny cut videos are worth a significant part of our daily time allowance. Let's set boundaries, explore consciously and use technology to connect, create and learn. Let's make it work for us, not the other way around. The best future is the one we built together, with a little human touch, lots of love and empathy, and a healthy dose of tech on the side.